okay uh, good morning uh, today we will have a uh, discussion on uh, long case on carcinoma gallbladder uh, dr milind alok ji is a third year junior resident at mr bangor hospital present the case and with us today is uh, professor shorob ghosh who is professor and head of surgical oncology at calcutta medical college we will moderate this session so milind you can share screen and start presenting and wait at the end of your history let us discuss and then proceed to the examination yes, good morning sir good morning Uh, sir, is the screen visible? Yes. Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Milinda Alokji, third year DNB PGT from Department of General Surgery, MR Bangla. Uh, my patient, Mrs. XYZ, 64 years Hindu lady, resident of Howrah and a homemaker, came with a chief complaint of pain abdomen since two years. The patient was apparently well two years back when she first had an episode of pain in the right upper quadrant of her abdomen. The pain was sudden onset and used to last for one to two hours. The pain was relieved with over-the-counter analgesics. The patient can recount about five to six such episodes over the last two years. For the last two months, the patient has had a continuous dull aching pain in the same region. She has noticed that the pain was aggravated after taking a fatty diet and decreases after oral, after oral analgesics but does not subside completely. The pain was associated with anorexia and episodes of nausea and vomiting. Patient has also noticed significant loss of weight over the last four to five months. There is no history of hematemesis or melina, no history of fever, night sweats, no history of altered bowel habits, no history of hematuria, burning maturation, no history of jaundice, uh, and there, is no, there are no features suggestive of any metastatic spread. In the past history, the patient is not a known case of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, tuberculosis, and not taking any medication regularly. There has been no previous hospitalization or surgeries, uh, and there is no history of blood transfusion. In the personal history, uh, the, uh, the patient is married and has two children, one son and one daughter, both are healthy, consumes a mixed diet, having no addictions, normal sleep pattern, and bowel and bladder habits are normal. Uh, menstrual history, uh, Minar was attained at the age of 13 years and menopause at 47, uh, has a history of regular menses lasting around four to five days with normal period. Uh, the, both the parents of the patient are deceased now, and but they died of natural causes. Has one sibling, male, 62 years old and in good health condition. No history of any cancer-related deaths in the family. Patient has self-medicated with over-the-counter painkillers uh, on as on need basis, but has not taken any medical assistance prior to the current visit. There is no history of any allergies. In summary, a 64-year-old lady presented with a history of pain in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen since two years. Patient has had about five to six recurrent attacks of sudden onset severe pain lasting one to two hours, which were relieved uh, with over-the-counter analgesics. For the last two months, the patient has had a continuous dull aching pain in the same region, aggravated after taking a fatty diet and not subsiding completely with analgesics. Pain was associated with anorexia and episodes of nausea and vomiting. Pain has also, a uh, patient has also noticed a significant loss of weight over the last four to five months. Go back to the history presented in the slide. So, shall we, shall we discuss now? Yeah, yeah, we can discuss the... So, so Dr. Milan, with the history that you've given so far, what are the possibilities that come to your mind? Uh, so, uh... Uh, with the with the history, uh, I believe that uh, uh, since the pain is in the right upper quadrant uh, and it has been a long term pain, uh, uh, I believe that uh, the patient is suffering from an illness that is involving the hepatobiliary system. Firstly, mm -hmm. uh, secondly, sir, uh, since there has been a change in the recent change in the nature of the pain, uh, and also uh, since the patient has complained of significant weight loss over the past uh, duration of four to five or total six months. Uh, so I uh, believe that uh, it might be pointing towards uh, a change in the nature of the disease that was earlier there. Uh, so uh, uh, um, so uh, other than hepatobiliary problems, would there be a possibility of containing the causes of upper abdominal pain, right abdominal pain? 
so, so, uh, so sorry, I'll... This, this pain, this Would pain... there be other possibilities yeah, of such a pain other hepatobiliary than hepatobiliary disease? How about a duodenal ulcer? Uh, Would a patient with duodenal ulcer have right upper quadrant pain? Uh, sir, uh, mostly an epigastric pain, sir, but it could also, patient could vaguely tell about a pain that is extending to the back also so it might confuse or might say that so, pain so, is going so to you right mentioned off. extending to the back the pain that you have mentioned did you mention any referral pattern any no, specific sir. radiation or referral no sir there is no radiation or no radiation. but did you mention that uh, no sir uh, so uh, typically when we are trying to talk about a hepatobiliary pain there is a classic radiation pattern okay. or sometimes there is also a referral to the shoulder it not always be present, but in history of presence, there was no relation of the pain or any referred pain to other deal. Okay. While you are characterizing the type of the pain. So, so it was intermittent in nature for the last three or four months. It is becoming constant, you are saying. Yes, sir. So now it is no longer related to meals. Initially, it was related to meals. The onset or the exacerbating factor was related to meals. Isn't it fatty meals? The patient had pain. Now yes, the patient does not uh, have that relationship with meals. The pain is constant. So the pain is constantly there, sir. And not, but it is not exacerbated by meals. Sir, yeah, sir. Earlier, over the past two years, since uh, it has been an intermittent episode, it is not something that the patient has uh, clearly. Uh, associated with meals because it, she has not noticed it so much but since it has been a dull aching pain since the last two months she, the pain persistently mm -hmm. is there but it also aggravates up it, she has noticed that it usually aggravates after a, a fatty or a heavy meat sir. but it continues to okay. be there it's a persisting pain sir is it relieved by any other medications like antacid is there a history of taking antacids Sir, uh, she has uh, mostly uh, taken drugs uh, from uh, over-the-counter drugs, sir, and she's usually taken painkillers. Painkillers. Entertain any extra abdominal pathology as a possibility in an elderly lady? Could it be an angina? Could it be a cardiac issue? Presenting so, with right upper quadrant pain. Mm. So I'm not sure, sir. So such a chronic history with no other symptoms, I'm not sure. So sir. recurrent history, even angina pectoris can have a recurrent history in an elderly lady. Most lower genomic conditions will in our don't really get tested for either diabetes or hypertension. So, even I don't test my blood sugar every year. So maybe she has diabetes, which she has not detected, and she is developing coronary artery disease that can present with epigastric pain or right upper abdominal pain, vaguely, okay. that may be exacerbated after meals. So what I'm saying is, at this point of the history, it is a very, very non-specific history. It is, there is no classical radiation pattern. There is no specific referral to the shoulders. There is no history of jaundice. There is no history of fever with chills. Even the pain, you have not described the term as a colicky pain. Have you used the term colic in your history? Uh, no, sir. I have not used the term colic. It is not a typical biliary colic type of pain, is it? Yes, sir. So just with the upper abdominal pain, which sometimes the patient cannot localize poorly, you know, visceral pain is not localized poorly. There are lots of possibilities. It could be a gastric malignancy. It could be peptic ulcer disease. It could be pancreatitis. Hmm. It could be a hepatobiliary disease. It could be cardiac cause rarely. So you should have a broad DD. And possibly you would like to elaborate the nature of the pain, the radiation, the referral, specific relieving factors. If they are not there, it, it may not be there. You Then you say specifically. Some of the negative factors you have to mention specifically. There was no typical radiation. There was no referral. There, the pain was not relieved by food intake. Since it is an upper abdominal pain on the right side. Right. Please carry on. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the pain history should have been more uh, specific. Patient having a pain in the right upper quadrant. And biliary colic pain has got some typical characteristics. Mm -hmm. And if the patient has got, if this is a biliary, you see, diagnosis of gallstone disease is based only on history. Yes. You won't find any examination finding uh, in uh, abdominal examination. So the history is very important. I would have been happy that you give more information about the pain, uh, what type of pain it is, whether it is preceded by fatty meal, uh, the uh, other points mentioned, Dr. Ghosh. So, history of pain, if it is a classic biliary colic, 
it is easy to come to a diagnosis that patient has biliary colics and as you said hepatic biliary disease is not a generalization if the patient has such attacks of acute episodes of colic pain it is most likely gallstone disease yes. and the pain character can change for two reasons one is the stone get impacted in the neck and impacted stone can cause a dull aching constant continuous pain yes. but these patient having an added symptom of loss of, uh, loss of weight and loss weight of appetite loss. that is a pointer towards you see gallbladder carcinoma does not always present with jaundice or advanced yes. disease it may present with subtle features yes. just a change in symptomatology and this anorexia weight loss is one of the important points in favor of a neoplastic change in the gallbladder pathology so we should be more specific about the history part so that you can pinpoint the uh, prob- probable cause of this pain okay i think otherwise history is uh, reasonable please carry on Uh, so, in general examination, the patient was examined after taking informed consent in a well-lit room and with proper exposure in the presence of a female attendant. The patient was conscious, alert, and cooperative. Karnofsky performance status was 80. Average built or decubitus of choice and gait was normal. BMI was 28.5. Uh, the vitals were within normal range. Uh, pallor was present, but there was no ictus, sinusitis, clubbing, generalized lymphadenopathy, or edema. Uh, in inspection in the abdominal examination inspection abdomen is flat umbilicus normal and inverted all quadrants move with respiration there's no localized fullness noted no scar sinus pulsation dilated veins bilateral hernia lordosis went intact and bilateral renal uh, renal angle is free in palpation abdomen is soft uh, there is no localized of temperature there is tenderness in the right hypocondrium gallbladder is palpable 2 cm below the right costal margin firm in feel and margins and surfaces are irregular Liver and spleen are not palpable. There is no other mass palpable. Hernia lordosis are intact. No renal angle tenderness and no inguinal lymphedema. Uh, the liver span is 11 cm at the midclavicular line and there is no evidence of free fluid. Uh, auscultation, normal bowel sounds are heard and in distal rectal examination, there is a stool stained finger and no mass was palpable. Uh, in systemic examination, uh, the systemic examination was essentially within normal. Uh, in summary, a 64-year lady presented with a history of pain in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen since two years. Uh, patient has had about five to six recurrent episodes of sudden onset severe pain lasting one to two hours, which were relieved with over-the-counter analgesics. With the uh, last two months, the patient has had a continuous dull aching pain in the same region, aggravated after taking a fatty meal and not subsiding completely with analgesics. Pain was associated with anorexia and episodes of nausea vomiting. patient also noticed significant loss of weight over the last 4 to 5 months on examination in general survey the patient had a moderate pallor no lymphadenopathy abdominal examination revealed tenderness in the right hypochondriac region gallbladder is palpable 2 cm below the right costal margin globular with firm consistency margins and surface are irregular liver and spleen are not palpable and no other mass palpable no free fluid in the abdomen normal bowel sounds heard no history or clinical evidence of metastatic disease so, Uh, could you just go back to your uh, examination findings, the palpation part, side yes. back? Yes, sir. So here in the palpation, you have immediately made a statement that gallbladder is palpable. Yes, uh, I would think that it is better that you say she has a lump below the right costal margin, and you have to again describe a few characteristics of the lump before you reach gallbladder. So. Or other you can ask her, ask him know? why it's a gallbladder lump. Exactly. Why do? You, how do you know it's a gallbladder mass? Sir, uh, a globular, uh, sir, a globular lump in the uh, right costal margin where we can palpate the, uh, where we can palpate all the margins of the of the lump. Uh, sir, it is the characteristic position all is that margins. of the. All the you margins. You mean you can reach above the swelling? No, sir, sir, above uh, the, the swelling. Sir, in, sir, sir, the lateral medial and the inferior margins, sir, we can feel and it is moving with the respiration, sir. So, so, so uh, what are the organs which? What are the organs on the right side which is uh, which move with respiration? So, uh, so the gallbladder and the the liver will the inferior margin of the liver so, can also. So be... I say I say this is a cystic lesion of the liver. You disprove it to me. What are the findings in your examination which go against this being a cystic lesion extending from the lower margin of the liver? 
say a hydrated sauce so the um, so the typical position firstly uh, no sir so the the firm of the mass the globular mass is it is a firm in feel so and so hydrated sauce may be globular and firm what how what shape do you expect a hydrated to be a hydrated bulging out from the lower surface of the liver at the site of the gallbladder where the gallbladder is that's where the gallbladder is almost pushed aside by the liver mass and the mass is there it is jetting out a little and you have said it is just palpable 2 cm below the right costal margin can you really appreciate uh, the surface of a 2 cm mass to uh, be able to say it's irregular to so say how much is 2 cm you should have some idea when you make that it is so small so that that little thing you are palpating it is moving with respiration can you really assess i don't know you have uh, not mentioned in the general survey what was her bmi like whether she was ob or not but generally this is associated with slightly obese ladies although she has some weight loss in the last few months so is it really possible to characterize the surface of a 2 cm lump so, so i think the... my my suggestion would be to say in your examination that it is a mass palpated in the right upper quadrant below the costal margin i cannot get above it i cannot insinuate my fingers between the mass and the costal arch <laughs> the upper limit cannot be reached or the upper limit is continuous with the liver dullness and because of all these features i think it is a gallbladder mass but a possibility could be that it is also a liver mass with some sort of a cystic degeneration or cyst yeah dr ghosh that is one way of description agreed uh, in exam they can describe the lump saying that the lump is having a medial border lower border lateral border palpable upper border not palpable uh, this uh, is appearing as a uh, irregular surface moving up and down in respiration suggesting this something in the uh, liver or in the gallbladder because it is starting in the right hypochondriac region so that is one of description or otherwise in postgraduate level they can say uh, uh, at the end that is is yes it's a gallbladder lump and then they should justify why he is saying that this is likely to be gallbladder lump so it can be either way but he should be able to defend Why he is saying that this lump is gallbladder? In that case, you have to describe the lump as it is. Okay, so yeah, so there is no really no other significant positive finding, but there are a few important negative findings. There is no icterus, there is no cervical lymphadenopathy, right? There is no ascites also. Yes, sir. Okay, so and the systemic examination was really not contributory, right? Everything yes. is essentially normal. so at the end of this uh, it's time for the provisional diagnosis right so what what is your provisional diagnosis at this point of time uh, sir uh, my provisional diagnosis is a 64 year lady with a history of right upper quadrant pain of changing nature and recent uh, weight loss uh, and palpable gall uh, gallbladder most probably due to a gallbladder pathology uh, where i'm uh, my diagnosis being carcinoma gallbladder without any clinical evidence of metastatic disease Uh, would you uh, give me some differential diagnosis? Uh, can it be also in the background of uh, polycystic uh, gallstone disease? Yes, because a patient has uh, so episodes of, of uh, 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 yes, episodes of biliary for two years, yes. two years history. So it should be on the background of a uh, probably a gallstone disease. Yes. And now the question: Would you like to offer a differential diagnosis? diagnosis? Uh, since the gallbladder is palpable, uh, uh, sir, we there can be it can be simply be an uh empyema of the gallbladder sir uh agreed then it can be um uh, uh, uh sir it can be pyocele sir uh yeah, empyema pyocele sir empyema sir mucosal gallbladder sir mucosal sir mucosal of the gallbladder sir mucosal with so much of pain dull aching constant pain little unlikely yeah. but yes Isn't... empyema yes empyema sir then anything else uh, uh so it can um, so it can be you see, uh, i i, I uh, keep telling you this i have seen this before also in presentations not your whoever presents since you have labeled this as a case of carcinoma gallbladder that you are presenting stop thinking think of the carcinoma gallbladder think of the patient talking you yes. have to think of other possibilities really the, the the these few things that you have said do not stamp it as a carcinoma gallbladder 
in the examination you have to come up with a provisional diagnosis and your provisional diagnosis of carcinoma gallbladder is perfectly acceptable yes. but there are lots of other possibilities so i i will be... offer you a couple of possibilities mirizi syndrome uh, okay tell me so it can be mirizi so, syndrome mirizi so mirizi so syndrome the, you should have the differential ready why are you having to think so much mirizi why not mirizi it could be one point against mirizi is that there is no jaundice In, although not all cases of mirizi mild mirizi there not be there not be any jaundice yes, but there yeah. may be sub clinical jaundice anything else uh so i say uh, it's a carcinoma pancreas it's a carcinoma head of pancreas you tell me what are the points against this being a carcinoma head of the pancreas uh so carcinoma head of the pancreas uh, would uh, uh, sir an epigastric lump uh, would no. be no before that no the, what is the process of the lump in a carcinoma head obstructive to say uh, progressive obstructive jaundice sir okay so there is no jaundice i yes. say this is uh, the gallbladder is just incidentally palpable because of mucosal the carcinoma head pancreas is not yet involving the bile duct the gallbladder is it's a double pathology it could yeah. be a double pathology it could be chronic pancreatitis so but um, in case of chronic pancreatitis sir uh, uh, some uh, uh, there would be some symptoms of uh, sir, uh, 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 poor insulin control sir uh, not necessarily not necessarily the patient may not be aware enough to give you history of diabetes history of symptoms related to diabetes did you mention that specifically that there is no, no polyuria there is no nocturnal diarrhea there is no the weight loss can be due to diabetes sometimes diabetes patients present with their weight loss yes so what i am saying is that keep some yeah. other possibility yes, in yes. mind yes always keep your mind open don't give a wild idea. diagnosis don't give a wild yes. diagnosis but be closer Uh, you can confine oh. here that yes, you have a gallbladder lump palpable, and stick to some diagnosis which may have actually gallbladder lump being palpable. A chronic pancreatitis can cause a lump gallbladder palpable if you have a uh, biliary tract obstruction. Okay. So you have to think about this. The examiner is going to ask you for differential diagnosis. Think about differential diagnosis with a slightly open mind. Yes, don't give a ridiculous diagnosis like sir said. But there are always some possibilities. Which you have to think of as a postgraduate training. So, assuming that uh, this is your provisional diagnosis for carcinoma gallbladder, what are the next investigations that you would do to confirm or refute your diagnosis? Uh, so, I would uh, now do investigations to confirm that uh, confirm the diagnosis. So, I would uh, I would like to go for an ultrasound of the whole of the organ. So, what are you expecting in the ultrasonography? What findings that would suggest that this is not just chronic polycystitis? But this is carcinoma gallbladder. Sir, so in an ultrasound, we uh, yeah, the certain pointers towards uh, uh, towards the disease would be an irregularly thickened uh, irregular wall of the gallbladder, sir. Uh, thickened mm -hmm. wall of the gallbladder, sir. Uh, then any mass, if uh, any mass, if it is uh, seen, any abnormally regular mass in the mm -hmm. gallbladder, sir. Uh, we can also further see if there are any uh, uh, metastatic deposits in the lymph node uh, in the uh, liver. any lymphadenopathy or uh, sir any uh, yes sir right is is ultrasound a very good test for lymph nodes lymph node enlargement no sir it Unless is not they are very very good it is sir, not very it very is sensitive. not a very sensitive uh, but sir it so uh, lymph node just add be... that so if if there are grossly enlarged nodes that ultrasound will pick it up definitely but otherwise the other points that you have said is valid uh, a question related to this this is this is a, maybe a slightly advanced uh, advanced uh, tumor the patient is having weight loss anorexia the patient has a history for two years almost there is a lump palpable but you know nowadays the carcinoma gallbladder is very often very often detected as an incidental finding after laparoscopic cholecystic cholecystic yes. so most cases of gallstone diseases that you take up for cholecystic tummy chronic cholecystitis the one and only investigation that we do radiological investigation that is is an ultrasonography of the abdomen yes. so are there any features in ultrasonography of the abdomen or of the gallbladder that would suggest the possibility of an early gallbladder cancer that you should read with suspicion when you read the ultrasound report of a patient whom you think is a just a cystitis chronic calculus cholecystitis some is suspicion there any feature some suspicious feature that should make you think that okay in this patient maybe i should get some other investigations done 
sir uh, irregular and thickened wall of the where you have to specify irregular thickened so even chronic cholesterol is irregular irregular irregular, 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 irregular and, mucosa, and the break and focal thickening break focal in the mucosa sir. focal thickening irregular focal thickening. break in the mucosa yeah okay. so, so these focal are thickening is more important findings hmm. yes sir so, so always take the ultrasound report because nowadays carcinoma gallbladder the most common presentation especially in the western world is accidentally detected after laparoscopic cholecystectomy and many an experts have reviewed it and seen that generally in the ultrasound there was one or two features which should have made the clinician suspicious that there could be something more than chronic cholecystectomy but they did not ignore it they just went with the stone thickened gallbladder it's a chronic cholecystectomy and then they lose the chance of a curative resection okay so uh, so ultrasound suppose has given you that there is a mass with there is a thickened gallbladder maybe the planes with the liver are a little blurred and obviously there are stones there is nothing else there is no obvious liver metastasis there is no lymph node there is no free fluid there is the rest of the abdomen is essentially normal there is no intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation what next so uh, if we are suspecting uh, uh, the carcinoma gallbladder so then the next step would be to go for a cct whole abdomen sir contrast ct whole abdomen okay mm -hmm. not an mri uh no sir and cct whole abdomen sir so why did not a mri why a cct abdomen what are the points in favor of ct scan uh, you are working in a good center you have got both ct and mri yes sir Uh, so, um, what, what is the idea? Yeah, already have a suspicion diagnosis of uh, carcinoma. So we, we, in we, CT, what are you trying to achieve? So we basically want to look for if there is any metastatic involvement. So if the liver is involved or if the lymph nodes are involved, sir. And so for so you think the MRI is inferior to CT in detecting small liver mets? Is that what you are saying? No, no. So lymph or lymphadenopathy, sir. Uh, as good as CT scan. Better than CT scan for detecting small liver mets, as good as CT scan for detecting regional lymphadenopathy. More. Than... So, if it's just a question of better, then MRI will possibly score over CT scan. You can't get away that way. You have to say something else. You have to say it is more expensive. You have to say it is. It takes a longer time. Data acquisition. So, motion artifacts may be an issue. Okay. Hmm. maybe for the thorax uh, ct scan would be better since you are also having this is part of the staging isn't it you would do a ce ct scan thorax abdomen okay but you you may there may be a role for mri where would you prefer to have an mri in spite of it being more expensive in spite of it taking a longer time in spite of it may not be freely available in your institute maybe there is an mri but every hospital has an mri but still you will know in this case i need an mr when would be that patient has got a gallbladder pathology and a yes, uh, patient has jaundice do you think uh, mr will be a better uh, बिलियर So in that case, I would definitely ask for an MRI with MRCP. Anything else? So, if the patient is allergic to contrast, if the patient has got renal failure, all the usual contraindications of CT scan. You have to say these things. By now, you should be able to say these. If the patient has got deranged renal function for some reason, you get the test done, routine test, and you find that the patient has elevated urea creatinine. Nobody knew. Patient was uh, hypertensive and has renal failure. Then you cannot do this contrast CT, and a CT scan without contrast is useless. Mm -hmm. You can you cannot also get a contrast MRI, but an MRI can give you a lot of information even without a contrast. Okay. So there are specific sequences which do not always need a contrast. So in that case, an MRI is a better choice. If there is a suspected vascular involvement, there is a mass which is involving the porta. On ultrasound, it's they have said 
that there is a heart which is extending into the porta there is minimal ih dehydration in that case you are worried whether the blood vessels of the porta vascular. are involved again so vascular involvement mri is better than ct scan so in these cases you will specifically ask for an mri but for most other cases if none of these things are present it is just a gall bladder mass maybe there is involving the liver and you want to do a staging you are absolutely right a contrast ct scan of abdomen plus thorax would be fine whole abdomen and thorax please carry so the first so sure of and doctor sure of first answer should be ct for a pg student yes absolutely and then absolutely. the mr should be go for discussion absolutely yeah i'm just discussing your answer is perfectly fine so so you have got the ct is done so ct scan is showing some amount of liver involvement no metastasis elsewhere there is uh, there are some nodes now what which node you like to specifically look for in ct scan which might uh, lead your uh, some decision making uh, uh, situation sir uh, change in the decision sir uh, we would uh, want to look for uh, uh, aorta cable node sir yes, because that can be seen in ct cable node if you see the aorta cable node is involved that, that is a very advanced disease. so we will not we will not then plan for a curative resection sir Mm -hmm. Okay, so the the type of node. Suppose they have not definitely said they are talking about node. They have said some uh, pericolidocal nodes or you know, nodes in the hepatitudinal ligament are enlarged. That's it. Maybe suspicious look retropancreatic nodes or pancreatic nodes. That is the term. Do enlarged nodes in the along the pore and in the peripancreatic vein. Now what? What next? Uh, so, uh, in, if, if are you convinced that this is CA gallbladder? It may not be CA gallbladder. Even now, to me, there are other possibilities. Tuberculosis. So then we can uh, we can uh, go we can go for a uh, so diagnostic lab, sir. No, no, no. Uh, so next step is diagnostic lab. You don't have anything else to do. You don't have any other thing in as your tool. Uh, about more basic investigations sir so, uh, needle so we we can go for so sir we can go for a uh, tumor markers we can go for ce and ca 99 sir so serum ca 90.9 and serum ca you have to say that don't it so what percentage of cases would you expect to have a serum ca 19.9 elevated in a in a castrum gallbladder sir i'm not sure about the Percentage, sir, but if it is elevated, uh, sir, so elevated is more. But so if it's a slightly early disease and you are not really sure whether it is CR or not, there are no definite uh, pointers to it being a malignancy. There is a who, what point. percentage you mentioned? What percentage so, you mentioned? I, I said it, 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 it varies from different series. So, in, if you take all stages of carcinoma gallbladder, almost 65 to 70 percent will of them will have elevated. But that is, if you divide them stage wise, say so stage one or stage two, which you are looking at for Please. sure. Stage four, there is no need for CA 19.9, mm -hmm. where there are five liver mates and there is jaundice, then uh, CA 19.9 will be elevated anyway. But you are looking at early stage. In early stage, the values are even less likely to be elevated. So maybe only 50% of early stage diseases will have elevation. So mm -hmm. one in two will not have CA 19.9 elevated. But that does not exclude carcinoma gallbladder. So what yeah. can you do? So there or, are no nodes on so uh, or otherwise, is frequently. Uh, or if I frame the question differently, uh, you have some CT evidence of malignancy, but uh, it's likely to be a localized disease. Do you need a uh, FNA proof for proceeding for surgery or you would like to have a FNA proof for uh, surgical treatment? FNA, we will not... Uh... I lost the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it? Ah, yes, now it's... Yeah. Sir, uh, uh, FNA proof to... Uh, <laughs> sir, we would only go for an FNA proof uh, in case of an advanced disease where we want so, to... So, if you have a imaging evidence of suspected malignancy, mm -hmm. so you want to say that a, a, a FNA is not mandatory to, for proceeding for surgery? No, sir. Yes. Not only is it not mandatory, you should be categorical and say that it is contraindicated, contraindicated. if otherwise the disease seems to be resectable. Because yes, 
Why? It will lead Why? to it will it will it will upstage the disease. It will lead to seeding. It, uh, is a, not will it may lead. It Use may, the term it may. may. It may lead to spillage of the cancer cells. Gallbladder cancer has a propensity for spillage and spreading along the biopsy tract, FNAC tract, spilling into the peritoneal cavity. And so, if otherwise the whatever is the pathology seems to be confined to the gallbladder, maybe there is a little bit of extension into the liver. The margins with the liver, the planes with the liver are a little blurred. There are no nodes elsewhere. There is no evidence of any disease elsewhere in the abdomen. Don't jeopardize the chance of a cure of a patient Curative by resection. doing a FNAC. You should be prepared to go ahead and do a definitive radical surgery, even for a possible benign disease. The final histopathology may come out to be just chronic cholecystitis. There is another disease in the gallbladder which yeah. very closely mimics it. Do you mm -hmm. know what's that? A, a lesion in the gallbladder, which will be looking like malignancy. Just yes, like malignancy. Your CT scan, you will not be able to distinguish. What and even that? during operation, you will find a lot of yes. difficulties. So uh, exactly. So, xanthogram versus cholecystitis is a real entity. It's not so uncommon. Once a year, once in two years, you will get a disease of xanthogram versus cholecystitis. And it is impossible to distinguish it on CT scan or even during the operation. Yes, even but during surgery also. Happy to, you should be happy to do a radical surgery and then for it to come out as Metascolecystitis, rather than the other way around, or rather than trying to prove it by a FNAC or a biopsy. So no FNAC or biopsy if it is a localized disease. So then you have got a CT scan which has got a equivocal finding. Like I told you, slightly thickened wall. There is a suspicion of a mass. There are lots of stones. There are no nodes elsewhere. So what next? CA 19.9 is also not elevated. There is no involvement of the biliary tree. What next? Sir, uh, Would a PET CT scan help? PET CT? PET CT. No, uh, no sir. No. So I'm, not, I'm not sure, sir. PET CT. PET CT, you see, for adenocarcinomas, particularly mesensy adenocarcinomas, are not uh, PET sensitive. So it's not uh, routine for a CA gallbladder to have a uh, different diagnosis PET CT. So no, that is not standard of care. What do you think? Sir, right. You get in specific areas for some problem solving tool. As a problem. Suppose you get a node elsewhere. The disease otherwise seems to be uh, uh, localized, but there is a node in the interior to cable region, or there is a suspicious lesion in the adrenal gland, or there is a small lesion somewhere else, and you're not sure whether that is malignant or that could be just uh, some sort of an artifact. In that case, you might use a PET CT scan and it may better delineate the nature of that lesion. It can occasionally pick up additional lesions that you have missed and clarify the picture that, yes, this is indeed a malignancy and it is metastatic widely, in which case you may have an alteration in the change of malignancy. So PET CT has a role, but a selective role, in, as not as a routine test in the uh, preliminary staging and not to be done in all cases. And in an early disease like this, probably it will not help you to decide whether this yeah. is indeed a malignancy or not. So what next? The patient has got certain risk factors, general risk factors. The patient is an elderly, obese person with some comorbidities, maybe ischemic heart disease, history of uh, stroke two years ago, poor effort tolerance. Patient is coming, although she is in her 60s, she is coming hobbling into your outdoor on a stick. Mm -hmm. What do you do? You are not. You are still not sure whether it is here gallbladder, but it is a very strong possibility. Thickened gallbladder. There is a suspicion of mass. There are lots of stones. Uh, so we would uh, we would uh, uh, look at the assess the patient for overall surgical fitness, and we will would want to go for a diagnostic laparoscopy, sir. How will the diagnostic laparoscopy help in this case? Uh, sir, again, we would, uh, uh, sir. Um, uh, so we can we can look at the uh, sir we, if we are still not sure sir we can uh, look at the peritoneum look at the liver and completely there is nothing uh, suppose okay you have done a diagnostic laparoscope and there is nothing in addition to whatever you say the gallbladder is appears thickened contracted uh, with the laparoscope when you are probing with the suction and all you can feel the stones inside it is hard there is something inside the gallbladder that's it what else can you see you can't see anything else just from uh, the diagnostic lab. There is no ascites, there is no serosal deposit, there are no grossly enlarged nodes. So then, uh, sir, if we, 
Sir, I'm not sure, but if we are still having a suspicion of a carcinoma gallbladder, you have it. Get, it's a thick and more thick wall gallbladder on CT scan. Yes, sir. The and suspicion sir, is there. Sir, but if everything else is pointing towards the fact that it is an early disease, then sir, we would preferably go for an uh, open cholecystectomy, sir. Open simple cholecystectomy? Um, so, um, you see, there, there are two situations. One is on putting the scope, there is no suspicion of gallbladder at all. Cancer. Yes, sir. You find the the thickening is probably a chronic cholecystitis. If you have no suspicion of malignancy, you can proceed for even a lab cholecystectomy. No suspicion of malignancy. But if you have any suspicion of malignancy, as Dr. Ghosh said, you should consider going for a radical cholecystectomy. And there is another modification like Lucknow approach. Exactly. So the SGPGI approach is what I am talking about, you know. Yeah. So that is known as anticipatory cholecystectomy. So I would I would differ slightly from Dr. Shah. You have on history a suggestion of of malignancy because there is weight loss, there is a constant pain, the change in the nature of the pain, and there is anorexia. On the CT scan, there is suspicion of a mass. So my contention is that just on a diagnostic laparoscopy, you cannot exclude these things. You have already done a CT scan. The CT scan has said that there is a suspicion of a mass. On the diagnostic lap, you cannot say that there is no mass. It is not sensitive enough. So if you go ahead and do a simple system, the plane of the simple cholecystectomy is between the muscular coat of the gallbladder and the cystic plate. You know what the cystic plate is? Yes, sir. Cystic plate is the connective tissue in the liver bed where the gallbladder is attached. So yes. when we do a routine cholecystectomy, a simple cholecystectomy, we dissect the gallbladder between the cystic plate and the muscular wall of the gallbladder. And that is exactly the layer in which a T2 gallbladder spreads. So if you just do a simple cholecystectomy, then you may end up causing spillage of the gallbladder, the exact thing that you wanted to prevent. At the same time, if you do a radical cholecystectomy, that may be too much. That may be a very big surgery. Radical cholecystectomy ideally means a segment 4B5 removal of the liver. It is a formidable operation. Yes, and then you end up finding that uh, the patient did not have cancer. And you have done an unnecessarily large surgery and there is morbidity of the surgery. There may even be mortality of the surgery. You have removed a lot of nodes. So the patient had complication related to the surgery. In the process of doing the liver resection, you injured the right hepatic duct. You caused a fistula. There are so many things that can happen when you do a radical cholecystectomy. And then only to find that it was not a cancer. So SGPGI Lucknow have said they do something known as an anticipatory extended cholecystectomy. So they remove the gallbladder with a wedge of one centimeter. So this is in those select patients where there is no clear cut liver invasion. There is no definite feature of a malignancy. Yet there is a strong suspicion of a malignancy. So they remove the liver with one, centi one centimeter of the liver along with the gallbladder. They will not remove any nodes. If it is an early disease, if it's a T1, B or a T2 disease, then this will give you adequate clearance and will prevent the spillage of the tumor that will happen during a simple cholecystectomy, and they will send it for frozen section. If on the frozen section, the diagnosis is confirmed, then they will, in the same sitting, they will complete the radical cholecystectomy because then they have proof that it is a carcinoma gallbladder. If it comes out to be chronic cholecystitis or xanthogranulomatous, then they will just terminate the operation there and it is not such a big operation as a radical cholecystectomy. Right. Just removing one centimeter wedge of the liver bed adjacent to the gallbladder is not such a major operation as removing segment 4B5. Okay. So I think that is a very reasonable approach and that is what I would practice in my in my day-to-day -day life. When I get this is a real problem, you know, that when you get a thickened gallbladder and the sonologist has raised the suspicion or the radiologist has raised the suspicion of a malignancy. In such an early case, my assertion is or my submission is that a diagnostic lab will not help you to solve the problem. Yes, diagnostic lab will not be able to tell you that it is just chronic cholecystitis and there is no focus of malignancy. Here. So you have to do a minimum of anticipatory cholecystectomy with one centimeter wedge of food. Doing a simple cholecystectomy can be bad if it does turn out to be cancer. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, what are the other possible presentations of carcinoma gallbladder? 
so uh, carcinoma called bladder can present uh, uh, in the setting of a uh, uh, chronic calculus cholecystitis as an incidental finding sir it can present uh, in case of it, it can present with an acute uh, calculus as in an acute condition acute calculus agree agree, agree. agree so that is somewhat similar to this although this was chronic but nowadays it now it is becoming more severe so then it is becoming more now anything else uh, sir it can present uh, as an advanced disease sir with uh, uh, obstructive jaundice with weight right loss. so a patient this same patient has got jaundice also ultrasound showed minimal ihb dilatation and uh, the ct scan has shown that there is ihb dilatation there is involvement the growth is going into the porta and causing involvement of the confluence of the duct so what now another important what is this vague symptoms you may have a patient who has got just anorexia weight loss just vague symptom these are the patient who may have a instant friend of gallbladder cancer so patient with obstructive jaundice how do you do what do you do why why there is jaundice in patient who has got a gallbladder cancer uh, so uh, they can be um, uh, there can be early infiltration of the mass into the uh, into the common hepatic when cell. when it happens which gallbladder site carcinoma is uh, having jaundice and still having early disease is near the neck 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 of the neck so of if the, the carcinoma place. starts in the neck, neck. Yes, sir. it can cause early infiltration so that may not be a very advanced disease so uh, neck gallbladder carcinoma can have uh, jaundice anything else for jaundice any other uh, mechanism sir if it is on the setting if it is on the setting of a uh, chronic calculus cholecystitis sir it uh, no no think of malignancy no, 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 that is different okay sir that is different that is also a possibility okay anything else what sir is saying due to malignancy but it is not a neck growth say it is a fundal growth or it's a body yes. growth which is more common yes, 60% sir. will occur in fundal yes, and body yes sir a lymph sir a lymph in yes, large sir. lymph node large uh, matted nodal mass at mass. the porta And can also cause an obstruction and usually Very liver waste. metastasis does not cause jaundice except a one or two metastasis in the liver may not cause jaundice mm -hmm. it will never it cause jaundice we see them so often most patients with liver metastasis there is no jaundice yes for the liver metastasis to cause jaundice a lot of the liver two will two thirds of the liver yeah. has to be in yes. yeah sir so, so jaundice as such we indicate jaundice. advanced disease yes with a mass in the porta like sir said it is it is uh, in the neck ma so what are the possibility it could be carcinoma gall bladder what else could it be uh, sir it can be uh, so then so we have to rule out the other possibilities of obstructive jaundice sir. so what are they what are they in this case uh, sir you, can... is it likely to be a cholecystitis at a mid 60s lady with a two year no, history sir. of pain no, no sir, history no, sir. of jaundice it, it, it can be a cholecystitis can be cholecystitis no sir cholangiocarcinoma can be cholangiocarcinoma right so a proximal cbt cholangiocarcinoma or a high risk cholangiocarcinoma coming low so yes. it can be a gallbladder cancer going into the bile duct it could be a bile duct cancer going into the cystic duct so yeah gallbladder cystic yes. duct yes. it will not go frankly into the gallbladder this is like sir said this is a lesion arising in the region of the neck or the yes. infundibulum or and the proximal cbd mid cbd structure what else it could be mirizis mirizis yes mirizi also sometimes causes us there because of the inflammation and all it is very difficult to understand <laughs> and stone is there even in carcinoma gallbladder what are what is the what are what percentage of carcinoma gallbladder associated with stones 80% sir 80 to 90% In some series, more than ninety percent. Okay. Will you entertain a benign pathology? Sir? Any benign lesion of the bile duct? Have you heard of benign lesions of the bile duct? Yes, sir. Cholecystitis, sir. Ah, ah, benign tumors, I mean. Oh, benign tumors. Benign Are there any benign bile. tumors of the bile duct? So I'm not sure. Gall bladder. So bile duct. No, uh, in the gall bladder. Do you have some benign lesion in the gallbladder which may mimic like malignancy? That is also described as a pre-malignant lesion in the gallbladder. 
Uh, porcelain. Pors no, porcelain is different. Porcelain is a calcified okay. thick uh, wall. Polyps. Uh, polyp. Yeah, yes. so you get polyps in the gallbladder. You get also get polypoidal lesions in the bile duct. Adenomas, papillomas, hmm. granulosa cell tumors, neuroendocrine tumors, neuronal lesions, huh? nerve tumors, all arising from the bile duct. They are very, very rare. Less than 5% of all <laughs> neoplasms are benign. Most of the overwhelming majority are malignant cholangiocarcinoma. So you generally hear discussion about cholangiocarcinoma. Any, any other cause for any other cause for grossly thickened gallbladder wall, which is benign? Grossly thickened gallbladder wall, which is benign. Sometimes people come to the report that there is uh, thickening of the gallbladder, no stone disease. Hmm. Uh, Sir has already given you a hint. Parasitic uh? No, no, no. Gallbladder wall is thickened as a whole. Wall is thickened. Why should it be parasitic infection? Parasites will be in the lumen. Chronic inflammation. That is that is known as adenomyomatosis. So chronic chronic cholecystitis is two type: calculus, a calculus, so, a calculus cholecystitis. These are the types: no? adenomyomatosis, adenomyomatosis, cholesterol polyposis. All these things. So they can also present with gallbladder focal thickness, but they will generally not have significant weight loss, not have yeah. significant anorexia. Yeah, they yeah. will never cause obstructive. Mostly chronic. asymptomatic, incidental finding. Oh. They, will, they can have just vague symptoms of cholecystite, but not these ominous features. So suppose this patient has got a jaundice. What can you do for this patient? Uh, a gallbladder mass going into the porta and causing jaundice. What now? Uh, so, uh, what should be your plan? Is a plan for curative uh, treatment or plan for a palliative treatment? Uh, so we, we, can, we will see if we can... Uh, Obtain a clearance. Uh, uh, Gallbladder mass causing porta metastasis. You think you can do a. Uh, no, not metastasis. Uh, sir, sir, let us say it is a mass directly infiltrating into the porta, okay, not okay. metastasis. Okay. Neck mass, like sir said, it's arising in the region of the infundibulum and the duct and it is infiltrating into yes. the junction of the porta and the right hepatic duct. So, what do you think? Obviously, if it goes to the porta before that, it will catch hold of the right hepatic duct. So, now yeah. what? Sir, uh, right hepatic duct would be too high up to, uh, sir, I'm not sure, but too high up to get a clearance. Sir. Otherwise, if we can get a uh, duct to mucosal clearance, yes. we can do a ruin my hepatic ostomy as a part of the uh, radical cholecystectomy to get a clearance of the cystic duct. Okay, well. agreed. If it is a segmental involvement of the mid CBD and the hepatic ducts are free, then you could, yes, jolly will do a contiguous segmental excision of the bile duct and do a rua by hepatic ostomy. You're absolutely right. Suppose this is directly going through into the right hepatic duct, right hepatic artery, that region. Then what? <laughs> so then we will probably go for palliative. So we'll there was a palliative. chapter, there was a chapter in recent advances uh, meant, uh, given chapter on radical surgery, aggressive surgery for gallbladder cancer. There we find there is no Japanese will not agree with you. Yeah. Japanese people will not agree with you. Yeah, yeah. So that chapter uh, mentions about all types of extended surgery. But if you think of the patient outcome, they will be saying at the end there are 5% uh, six month survival. So that sort of survival with this aggressive surgery may not justify. Uh, but because they are mentioning about all types of radical surgery. Uh, Pancreas so to me. We, you should know it. You may not do it. You may not do it, but you should know it. So yeah. if the right duct is involved, the right hepatic artery is involved. So what do you need to do? What do you think needs to be done? If you think of a curative resection. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so keep in mind that in, in gallbladder cancer, a right lobectomy is not adequate. Yes, sir. If you at all do a correct, why uh, why why is it not why is it not adequate? So, because the uh, the the bed of the, the gallbladder bed, the fossa, sir, it is uh, it basically it is uh, related to both the left and the right side, sir. In both the first, second, and five. Segment four, four B and five is the minimum that you five. have to remove. Yes. So yeah. four B is part of left lobe. Left so lobe. just doing a right hepatectomy won't do. It you won't have do. to do. So what is that term called? Yeah. Extended. Extended. Extended, extended right hepatectomy, sir. So if the right duct and the right hepatic artery have to be sacrificed, then you have to remove the right lobe. But since level four, segment four, we all removed, so it has 
extended right hepatectomy along with excision of the right hepatic duct and part of the duct also if it's required and then the remaining left duct is anastomosed to the uh, jejunum the loop of the jejunum so it's an extended right hepatectomy with a regional lymphadenectomy followed by a hepaticodocal jejunoscopy so it is a possibility Dr. you should Dr. Shura, what do you think about new adjuvant sir new adjuvant is not mentioned as new adjuvant specifically but you give we often give palliative in such patients where we think that the operation is not feasible suppose there is a interaortic cable node there is, so it that becomes a m1 disease it's a non regional node so in that case the term we use is palliative chemo now after three cycles of chemo the medical oncologist repeats the imaging repeats the imaging to see how the patient is doing and he finds that all the nodes have vanished even the mass has shrunk radically yeah. yes. then they will often send the patient back to us for consideration of a curative surgery so in such cases we often do a surgery because the only known cure of bladder cancer is yes. a surgical <laughs> removal so we give the benefit of doubt so although initially the patient was m1 disease because it was oligometastasis maybe there was just one paraortic node which was enlarged and metastatic otherwise the patient was a confined disease and the node has now disappeared with chemotherapy we consider for surgery so in this case the chemotherapy becomes new adjuvant but we don't call it new adjuvant yeah. when we send the patient to chemotherapy we call it we are sending for palliative chemotherapy because it is an m1 disease or it is a locally advanced disease to such extent that we cannot do the operation okay so we don't use the term new adjuvant but in some cases it can be new adjuvant gallbladder yes. cancer occasionally does respond well to chemo yeah, yeah it's not standard of care but uh, there are some uh, publications saying that uh, some patient respond well and you can they definitely uh, respond. we have seen we have seen we have done that some of them have a very good response and the specific lesions which was making it inoperable are now not there after two or three cycles of chemo so we tell the patient that your prognosis is still bad but we can give you a chance so if you are happy to take the chance we can do this So there is some role of surgery after giving the chemotherapy. So in that case, it becomes new adjuvant chemo, not just palliative. Okay. So what about the patient with jaundice? Will you operate up front, or will you do something to stent or reduce the, the jaundice? First, we will reduce the first. We will reduce the amount of. How surgery. will you reduce jaundice? This is a high up specter, isn't it? This is probably involving the right duct and the confluence at the porta. So what will you do? Will it be an ERCP guided, or will it be a PTC guided? PTP, uh, PTP, PT, uh, VD, sir, uh, percutaneous. Sir. You see, it, it is PTP, it, 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 internal PTP. training is better. If, if the ERCP people can succeed, then internal stenting is a better option. Yes, sir. because PTBD is a uh, percutaneous procedure. A uh, patient has to manage a bag. So, if it is feasible to have a ERCP stenting, that is the first uh, chance one should take. If not feasible, then definitely PTBD. PTBD. so after ptbd can you avoid the bag and the drain are you aware of it nowadays in most yeah. food centers after yes. a few weeks of a ptbd they will internalize the stain yes. once the drainage is established they will use the ptbd track to put in a stain and that will go in through proximally so just like ercp puts the stain from below they will put in the stain from above and so the patient will not have a drain and a bag after a few weeks you cannot do it immediately because the track has to form the ptbd track but you can do it yeah. but my question was so suppose you are doing a ptbd you have tried ercp stenting it has failed you have gone for ptbd you have asked the radiologist to do ptbd so now because it is at the confluence the right ductal system and the left ductal system are separate because it is also involved the right duct right so which side will you drain so i'm not sure sir because the confluence is cut off you understand my question the right ductal okay. system is dilated the left ductal system is dilated yes, they sir. are separate one drain will not drain both system so which one will you drain first <clears throat> so the left one because the right one already has the infiltration uh, the right duct so is infiltrated it is the extremity part in the extremity part you are drain the intra that is the, the liver is fine which one will you drain first so not sure 
you are right actually we will drain the left pelvis why what is the aim of drainage here we are planning the patient for a surgery so surgery, what surgery yes, will it be the surgery will be a extended we'll right, the right part. we said because it is more likely that the right duct and the right artery is involved that we'll is the closer going. to the gallbladder isn't it so you will remove the girl right part of the liver so what is the use of draining that the remnant liver the liver that the patient will live with in the post op period the future liver remnant is the left duct so you want that liver to regain its function so yes you are right you will ask the radiologist specifically because sometimes the radiologist doesn't understand these things he will put in the drain in the right system because that is easier technically technically it is easier to do a ptbd on the right side but you would specifically tell in a case of ca gallbladder that you must put the ptbd in the left ductal system and drain that so that the left liver recovers the function so now you are planning this patient for a major surgery so we, we are surgeons let us discuss surgery we have time sir actually i don't have a yes sir 5 minute. minutes so we have 5 minutes, minutes more 5 okay, minutes okay quickly so we are planning for a extended right hepatectomy you have gone to japan and you are planning so how will you assess the patient for a major liver resection uh, you can just take the patient up with these investigations uh, no so we will be so we will we have we have to completely assess the patient the complete assessment of the patient how the how, how? Surgical, quickly so starting from blood investigation So, starting from blood investigations, the liver function test, coagulation profile, mm. all has to be improved, mm. sir. Uh, so then, after that, uh, sir, you have done the you have done the PTBD of the left side. So now, coag profile and all is fine. Anything else? What about the FLR? You know what is FLR in a major liver resection? Future. Uh, we have to think of FLR, future liver remnant. Liver remnant. How much remnant. should that be? How much should that be in a patient uh, in a normal liver? How much should that Theory be in a liver. patient who has received chemotherapy? वॉल्यूम ऑफ दल आर Okay. So by imaging, sir. Uh, so imaging, we have done the CT scan. How does the you can see the CT scan? The right extended right will go. That is your plan, isn't it, sir? As we yes. discussed, that for a gallbladder with involvement of the right hepatic duct, you have to do an extended right hepatic duct. So you have the CT scan. How does that tell you whether the remnant liver is thirty percent or not? Then so suppose you have a experienced liver surgeon like Dr. Ramdeep. He they will mostly eyeball it, eyeball estimate. But there has to be a basis for that. So what is the basis? The right hemi liver contributes two third of the volume of a liver on an average. This is average. Left hemi liver constitutes one third. So if you are doing a right hepatectomy, you are removing sixty six percent. So remnant is thirty three. If you are doing an extended right, so that is even less than thirty three. How much less? The segment two and three. Contribute half of that remnant, that one third. You understand? The left liver is one third of the total volume. Of this one third, half is segment two and three, and half is segment four. So, if you are removing four B, with so, uh, say another eight uh, percent is going. So, seventy-two percent of the liver is going. So, you are only left with twenty-eight percent. So, this is an estimate, gross estimate. Suppose you want a more more accurate estimate, then what do you do? Just the CT scan will not help. there has to be something else so there are softwares you know so there are softwares volumetric softwares which are, we have to buy them they are very expensive it's like osirix so as a person you should know these names that there is a software that can do a volumetric assay and tell you you have to paint it obviously you have to paint on that the segments that you are going to remove and then they will take all the ct images the software and it will calculate and it will tell you so flr is going to be this much suppose the flr is adequate if there is an anatomical assessment isn't it Is there any functional assessment of liver for a major liver resection? This is an extended right hepatectomy. It's a major surgery. Yes, sir. Do you know of any anatomical tests? Uh, sorry, functional tests. Anatomical is the CT scan. It is so this much is removed, this much is left. But the le the part that is left, it was jaundice. You have stented, but maybe the function is not recovered totally. Fib Fibro scan, function? sir. How does the function? Beg your pardon. Sir, a fibro scan, sir. Elasto elastography, sir. Uh, yes you can do elastography that is one way of assessing yes anything else 
fibrous can definitely helps in assessing a uh, effect of pre cirrhosis suppose there is a background hepatitis infection and you are worried about the amount of cirrhosis yes that can be done so otherwise i'm i'm, I'm not aware of uh, you have not have indocyanin green i see retention normally indocyanin green is a dye that is taken up by the hepatocyte actively cleared so at 15 minutes less than 15% of the indocyanin green should be retained in the blood if it is more than that then that is abnormal so that is very commonly used in those centers which are generally doing liver dissection in addition there are lots of other things there is metabolism of linocaine then there are certain uh, radionuclide studies like hida scan using technetium labeled albumin all these are functional studies they take up these things and they can assess how much the liver is taking so this is not just anatomical this is also functional okay. assessment of the remnant liver so all this becomes important when you are doing okay what about the lymph nodes when you do a lymphadenectomy what are the nodes that you remove uh so we remove the um, um uh, the perit uh, the peri pericolidocal uh, the uh, uh, then uh, the pericolidocal the right celiac the um, the right pericolidocal means around the duct anything else in the other portal sir, vein and hepatodurnal sir ha so hepat that is the hepatodurnal node pericolidocal yeah. nodes are in the hdn yeah Um, pericolidocal periportal so you say pericolidocal. all the nodes of the hdl all the nodes on the fibro fatty tissue of the hdl yes. you will remove upwards plus from above the level of the upper border of the pancreas what is num pancreatic so then if we are going for a radical then we'll uh, remove the ones on the uh, like side uh, up to the root of the pancreatic around the head and as my name retrodurnal okay. node yes sir retrodurnal node Retro peripancreatic Retro node around the head of the pancreas and the celiac node celiac node briefly can you tell me the staging of uh, what are the changes in the 8th edition tnm staging as compared to the 7th edition sir so, i'm not aware about the changes uh, there are certain the changes the the what what in 8th T two they have made into T two A and T two B initially the T two A T two B T two A is the involvement of the subserosa on the T two T two A is on the involvement of the subserosa on the peritoneal side and T two B is on the liver side on the hepatic side. So obviously they are suggesting that is worse. The involvement of the liver side is worse because that is T two B that's a higher T2B. state, right? Yes. So that is one change. Then the, what about the nodes? What about N one and N two? In the seventh the, edition, N one was regional node, the pericolidocal nodes and the cystic duct node. But now the N one and N two have been designed on the basis of so number of number nodes. of nodes, number, number of, of nodes. nodes. Yes. So one, two, three nodes, N one. More than N1. three nodes, they three have N1. not specified the location. They have just used the term regional nodes. Regional. Okay. Yes. So these are some of the changes that you should yeah. be aware. Not a good. We have uh, gone okay. beyond time. Gone out of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We have good presentation. Uh, nice. good. These are the these are the things one PG should remember that he should uh, approach the case rationally and think of uh, all differential diagnosis and uh, uh, rational uh, way of uh, investigation. Uh, anyone else like to make a comment? Mahanda. Yes, doctor. Hello. Mahanda. Yes. Good yes. morning. Uh, Shura, thank you. I'm seeing you after a long time in the COVID period. I see Mahonda yeah. regularly. Extensive mm -hmm. coverage, very good. I want to highlight few things. One is sometimes the, we see the surgeons do incidental cholecystectomy and patient presents with a pain abdomen, and six months later we find there is some other cancer or disease harboring into the abdomen. So what Professor Mahonda has said, take a good history, and and try to identify whether it is a cholestone disease. Or some other disease cropping up in the abdomen. One, two is if you suspect gallbladder carcinoma, you must write that that, that you, we want to exclude this and tell it to the radio, radio, radiologist who is doing that. And one thing is the asymmetric thickening and concentric thickening. So uh, these things we should clarify. And in most of the cases, what we find uh, after a, a, a cholecystectomy, laparoscopic cholecystectomy, that the ultrasound has shown there is thickening in the wall. So this is very important. So then we can avoid the cholecystectomies, unnecessary cholecystectomies. Two, three is that uh, MRI plate. MRI plate 
as you know mri is a hydrogen ion concentration that is put into the into the magnetic field so there are two vascular structure what, what uh, saurav has said is a portal vein cbd and the uh, hepatic artery hepatic. so these are basically water column so mri is the best test to measure its standard so these are the few things i want to add rest is fantastic okay thank you thank you very thank much thank you thank you dr boshan thank you dr shurup thank you so